Good morning, church. Happy New Year. It is actually the first day of the year, and it's a Sabbath. And as Tash and a few others have already said, which is super special, right? And I didn't actually realise that the last day of the year is a Sabbath as well, so even more special. You know, if I could pick one week out of the year, or my favourite week to preach in the year, it would most definitely be the first week of the year. In fact, um, I love preaching sermons on the first week of the year. Um, so much so that I was reminded of it recently that I've actually preached the last four out of five years the first week of the year. <laughs> so maybe I'll do it again next year. Who knows? But here I am for the fifth time to share a message with you on the new year. For me, there is something really special about fresh starts. There's something really special and inspiring and exciting and deeply reflective about the opportunity to reset and start again, the chance to set new goals or try new things. And of course, I'm not alone in this. So what is it really for so many people in society that brings them together in huge crowds to watch fireworks, to party, to celebrate the turn of a year? to celebrate this one minute, essentially, each year. Beyond that, what is it that seems to draw people into self-reflection and goal-setting as they pen down their resolutions for the year? What is it about the new year that provides this burst of energy? Paula Anderson, who writes on the Age Care blog, says the following. The meaning of most holidays is clear. Valentine's Day celebrates romance. July 1st, independence. Thanksgiving, productivity. This is clearly an American person here. Um, American holidays. Christmas, goodwill towards men. The meaning of New Year's, however, the world's most celebrated holiday, is not so clear. On this day, many people remember last year's achievements and failures and look forward to the promise of a new year, of a new beginning, but this celebration and reflection is the result of more than an accident of the calendar. New Year's has a deeper significance. What is it? She has a valid point here. So what is it about New Year? What does it actually mean? New Year, wiki.com, digs a little deeper, saying the following. New Year is not just about celebrations and resolutions. It is more than what meets the eye. It symbolises motivation for many new beginnings. If you ask us why New Year is celebrated, then our answer is that the meaning behind celebrating the New Year is not just about welcoming a brand new year successfully and making easily breakable resolutions or promises. There is a hidden meaning to it, as the future cannot be predicted. The resolutions can make us resolute to make it predictable with the deeds we do at the very present. I'll read that again. As the future cannot be predicted, the resolutions can make us resolute to make it predictable with the deeds we do at the very present. Though we know that uncertain days are on the calendar for us, we commit to promises to make them certain, or at least we try. So maybe it comes down to this collective prospect of being able to regain control. You see, as the year goes on, our lives seem to increasingly unravel with busyness, broken resolutions, unmet deadlines and goals, fatigue. Our healthy habits slip away as we put on weight, work stress builds up, and then comes December. You all know what that means. Christmas shopping, road to Bethlehem, end of year school events, organizing celebrations, credit, cards de credit card debts, unhealthy food everywhere, we officially lose control. But we somehow pull it all together into one final big celebratory crash, the prospect of that special time of togetherness and remembrance over Christmas each year pulls us through. But then there is something in our subconscious. There is a sense that the reset button is near. Because just days after the chaos of December, which crowns the gradual unravelling of our lives throughout the year, there is a wonderful little thing called the new year. 
And so we get on the scales and finally confront that Christmas weight gain. We look at our credit cards, our credit card statements. We reflect back on all the things that have not been achieved in the last 12 months and we pen our New Year's resolutions. Or at the very least, we say, I'm going to do this better or that better this coming year. It's the opportunity we wait for all year to pull it back together. Psychology PhD Raj Raghunathan says, human beings have a deep-seated desire for certainty and control. Several studies show this need serves at least two important purposes First, it helps us believe that we can shape outcomes and events to our liking. That is, the more in control we feel, the more efficacious we feel about achieving the outcomes we desire, and this sense of competence boosts our well-being. But control also feels good because it makes us believe that we aren't under someone else's control. You see, church, we like control and certainty. We like to know that things are in check and within our realm of comfort. On the other side of that, we struggle with uncertainty and chaos. And it goes deeper than just our schedules getting overly packed or the end of year fatigue or the number on the scales rising. People hurt us and break our hearts. We have no control over being able to fix the situation and it weighs us down and eats away at the very core of our being. A loved one suddenly gets terminally ill and we have no control over what will happen to them. Coronavirus comes along and plummets the world into paralysis. We go from one year of mostly lockdowns to another year of mostly lockdowns, and new variants just keep coming along. We have no control over the situation or how our lives will look. Often in life, it is as this quote by Jennifer DeWile says, gaining control is as possible as taking a picture of a unicorn and maintaining it is as easy as catching the wind. Yet even though we know unicorns don't exist and catching the wind is impossible, we still strive for control. Even the whole idea of a new year reset is really just an illusion. Although it may provide a temporary burst of motivation, at the end of the day, how can the changeover from 11.59 on December the 31st to 12 a.m. on January the 1st, flip the switch and suddenly allow everything to be well controlled and reordered? How can this one minute lapse suddenly remove the chaos, unpredictability and challenge of our lives? Deep inside, we know it's impossible, and yet we still strive for control. Even in our spiritual lives, we often wrestle for control, maybe by trying to fit God into a box that is comfortable for us to digest or grasp, We grasp onto the things that we do, the behaviours that make us feel better about our standing with God. Or maybe we simply just don't let God in. Deep inside, we know it's impossible, and yet we strive for control. As Christians, there is this added layer to all this. We often hear about how we are meant to surrender to God and give and trust him. We know that we are meant to let go of the steering wheel, right? The steering wheel of our lives and give God the reins. We read verses about trusting in the Lord with all our hearts and leaning not on our understanding. Verses about not being anxious about anything but praying about everything. We read verses about denying ourselves or taking up our cross and following him. We know that we are not meant to solely rely on our works or on our efforts to feel confident before God, or that we shouldn't be worrying ourselves about the temporary things of life, that we shouldn't be striving and dedicating all our efforts to earthly pleasures. And yet, we struggle. We struggle and wrestle with God to hold on to every precious piece or ounce that we can. We strive to find some substance, some semblance of control over things that can be overturned in an instant. Even when we know unicorns don't exist and that we cannot catch the wind, we still try. We still strive for control. We still hold on to that illusion. But it creates in us such an aversion to let go and trust. Why is it that we would sooner trust our own fallible, limited and deceitful hearts than the very one who created us? Well, there are a number of barriers from our human perspective, right? 
No small one being that we cannot physically see God. Our whole practice of trust already stands on a premise of faith that there is a good, loving God out there, a creator who wants what's best for us. Another barrier is our limited understanding of the big picture of the spiritual realms. Ephesians 6.12 says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's a lot. I mean, we watch Avengers and all that, right? Cosmic creatures colliding with Earth's inhabitants. A battle of cosmic proportions. But maybe sometimes it doesn't hit us just how significant and real and serious our own cosmic battle is. It is something we have very limited understanding of. And by trusting God, we are basically putting him putting faith in him and putting him in the, steer, in the front driver's seat to steer through this vast, dark, black space beyond our comprehension. It's all real, friends. So how does this whole trust journey with God practically look in reality? Today, I want to take us to a story in the Bible that may help us draw some practical lessons in regards to trusting God and how it looks in real life. But before I get into it, I want to introduce you to our key character of today, which is, of course, Peter. So Peter, the disciple of Jesus, from the earliest stories that we see of him in the Gospels, we see someone who is a doer. He's a man who knows what he wants and puts every effort in to get the outcome he desires. He is a man who likes to be in control. One of the earliest stories we see of Peter in the Bible is him out on the Sea of Galilee all night trying to unsuccessfully catch fish. It doesn't even cross his mind that God might be able or willing to help him, even when Jesus is there at the dawn asking him to cast his net again. The same man is later seen rebuking Jesus when he predicts his death. We see this same man deciding to build dwellings for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration so that he can bask in their presence for a little longer. We see him impulsively cutting off a soldier's ear to protect Jesus and stop him from fulfilling his own destiny of death to save the human race. So we can see it pretty clearly that Peter likes to be in control. He likes things to fall a certain way, and he struggles when things don't line up the way he expects. So let's get into our passage for today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Now, just before this passage takes place, Jesus and his disciples are coming off the back of a huge day. The crowds had followed them madly and desperately across the Sea of Galilee. As Jesus took compassion on them, he gathered them together and he taught them. They then all became hungry, and a miracle is performed where Jesus multiplies a few loaves of bread and fish to feed 5,000 people. Now everyone is tired and disperses, and this is what happens next. Let's read from verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismisses the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, 
the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Have you ever wondered why Jesus called Peter onto the water? Did he just set him up to fail? First, Jesus appears on the water. Well, actually, let's take a step back. First, he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him. And he goes up into the mountains to pray. Then he actually comes out onto the water. I mean, he didn't have to do that. He is God. He could have pulled out a boat and created a patch of clear weather that hovered over him and followed him along until he met them on the sea and then he calmed it. Or he could have just calmed it from the shore and told the disciples later. There are so many options. But of course, Jesus chose the most unexpected supernatural route, the walking on water one. So here are the disciples struggling in this storm. Now these are experienced fishermen, mind you, and they know these waters They are really stuck, and so Jesus walks on water towards them. Just casually, you know, just walking along. The disciples are petrified, but of course, Peter in his impulsiveness says, Jesus, if it is really you, let me come out and meet you on the water. Now, Jesus could have shut this down right there. Jesus, full of infinite wisdom, surely would have been able to say something that made total sense in order to discourage Peter, but no, Jesus does the unthinkable and calls Peter to come to him. So here it is, the moment of faith. And look, we give Peter a hard time, right? Yes, he wasn't perfect. Yes, he took his eyes off Jesus. Yes, he became afraid. Yes, he likes to get his way. Even later, he denied Jesus. But in this moment, he shows faith. There's no other way around it. He shows trust and faith. Not a moment's hesitation is recorded. He just goes right in. It's a true moment of surrendering control. You see, this is the moment we all talk about, the moment of letting go control and going with God, the moment we are all looking to be inspired by in our own faith journeys. This is it. And for a few blissful moments, it is everything we could imagine. His feet actually hold above the water. He actually stands. But then it happens. Suddenly, he begins to sink. The problem is back. The waves, the intense storm, well, it never really left. It was always there. But for Peter and his viewing window, it's back. And he sinks. Jesus reaches out to save him. They go back into the boat and the storm dies down experience over. Amazing, but suboptimal. Not what Peter probably expected, or any of the disciples for that matter. So why? Why did Jesus call him out? I would like to spend the remainder of our sermon suggesting three possible reasons for us to consider today as to why Jesus called Peter out from the boat. And the first that we will start with is this. I believe that Jesus called Peter out onto the water to show him and the disciples, and by default us, that there is something more beyond their little world, and it is huge. You see, in this story, the disciples were desperately focused on their battle with the sea and their lives that were at stake, and there is nothing wrong with that necessarily. I mean, it's okay to want to take steps to get ourselves out of a situation, But in many ways, that was all they could see. All else was forgotten. The crowds, the supernaturally multiplied fish and bread, the countless miracles and healings of the past few days, teachings that they had heard from the mouth of Jesus. That night, it was all forgotten. All that was left was the boat and the crashing storm. Sounds familiar, right? I'm sure you've been there, as have I, when everything else no matter how wonderful or amazing, fades away as our viewing lens zooms in closer and closer and closer until all we are left with is our pain, our loss, our frustration, anger, apathy, disappointment with others and ourselves. 
but I love the analogy and symbolism we see here. Jesus sitting on this hill, communing with God the Father, overlooking the entire sea. And I can tell you, I've been to the Sea of Galilee with my dad, and when you sit a hundred, even a couple hundred meters up from the shore, you really can see the entire sea from far left to far right. It is one of the most amazing viewing windows. So here is Jesus sitting on this hill, overlooking the sea, talking with his Father God, with this ultimate viewing platform. And below he sees the disciples battling with the sea, losing all hope. He doesn't remain there and watch, though. He doesn't wait for them to remember him and call out. He comes out to them. He comes to meet them in their reality in the most unexpected way, walking on water, inviting them, enticing them almost into something beyond what they can see or imagine. And for a brief moment, they see it. Beyond the boat that they are desperately trying to keep afloat and beyond their lives that they are trying to save, there is the natural, the mighty crashing waves, the sea, the forces of nature that can kill them and take their life in an instant. And there is the supernatural. There is Jesus walking on water. And the bottom line is, he has power over all of that. Sometimes... Part of stepping out in faith and letting go of control is slowly learning to embrace that there is something more out there than what we can see. That our viewing window is limited on our lives and the world around us. It is about recognizing when God is inviting us, enticing us almost, to take a small step out, to zoom out just a little. It is about taking that step out with God to a place way beyond ourselves, even for a brief moment, to see what is out there by his side. The second reason I want to put forward today as to why Jesus may have called Peter out onto the water is this, that trusting in God does not always bring about the outcomes we expect. I mean, why couldn't Jesus have manufactured the perfect ending for Peter here? Well, it is well within his power, right? Why did he allow the troubled sea to remain and, by extension, for Peter to end up sinking? He could have calmed the sea as soon as Peter stepped foot on the sea, just as he did with the Israelites when they stepped foot in the Jordan River and it parted. Peter sinking is not the outcome that he or us hoped for. It's kind of, as I said before, a suboptimal ending, a downer. In life, we expect that certain steps of faith should result in certain outcomes. I pray for God's guidance to help me get the right job, and I expect a job to open up. I pray for God to resolve a certain conflict, and I expect him to heal the relationship over time. I pray for a battle or internal struggle in my life, and I expect healing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with expecting God to show up in a certain way. But that's not how it always works. Trusting and following God is not meant to be an outcomes-driven activity. You may have heard the analogy before that God is not a vending machine. We don't put in our one dollar and get what we paid for. It's not about the outcomes. It's about the experience. It is not about God immediately fixing all our problems and giving us the outcome we hope for, parting our seas, raining bread from heaven, restoring our fortunes, and giving us a nice little life that we deserve. More often than not, it's about stepping out in faith with no change in our circumstances to meet Jesus in a supernatural way on the stormy sea. I'm going to say that again. More often than not, it's about stepping out in faith with no change in our circumstance to meet Jesus in a supernatural way out on the stormy sea. To see him and experience him in a way we could have never imagined previously and be part of something way beyond ourselves. So that brings me to the third lesson that I want to bring out of this story today as to why Jesus called Peter out onto the water. And that is, baby steps are expected. 
Trusting and exercising faith are not a one and done experience. Peter failed from a human perspective. He took a step and then sank. He needed Jesus to save him, but he took a step. Later on, believe it or not, Peter was going to have to take much larger steps than walking out onto the water. Much larger steps of faith, such as trusting God to translate his speech to people of various languages, trusting God to change hard hearts, and trusting God to even raise the dead. But it all began with a baby step and a fall on the Sea of Galilee. You see, God wants and expects our baby steps in this journey. Imagine if Peter's walk on water was picture perfect. Imagine with me for a moment, Peter steps out onto the water and immediately the sea is stilled. He comes to meet Jesus and they embrace as everyone behind them in the boat smiles and laughs and looks on with wonder. And then side by side, they walk peacefully along the sea talking about life and God and faith as the sun rises and its rays glisten over the sea. And then they walk to shore all the way. Now, that would be an ending, wouldn't it? That would be something. But where would that leave us? Where would that leave Peter? It's not a picture of the reality we face or the reality that Peter would later face in his ministry. The reality is that we are living in a sinful world, and as long as we are, we will fall, and we will begin to sink many times over in our journey. And I don't know about you, but I want to know that when I start to sink almost immediately after making a bold declaration of faith and stepping out to follow God, that I have a saviour who will lovingly and graciously grab me by the hand and haul me out again. I have a saviour who will pull me back into that boat and keep taking me with him, one baby step after another. You know, church... There is one more little bonus lesson I want to draw out of this passage, and that is, at the end of the day, it's all about him. At the end of the day, it's not about all our problems being fixed. It's not about Peter having a grand old time on the sea with Jesus, though that can still be a side effect of the journey of trust and faith. But at the end of the day, it's about God. It's about who he is. It's about what he is doing around us. It's about him being able to take Peter's journey, your journey, my journey, and lead us into an eternity with him. It's about him being able to use our stories and draw many other hearts along the way. So as we wrap up, what's ahead for your new year? Where is your trust journey with Jesus going to take you? As you think back on the year past and set goals for the year ahead, which, by the way, there is nothing wrong with, (laughs) even though we were talking about control earlier on, but while you do all that, I encourage you to take some time to reflect on your own trust journey with God and where you are still afraid to let go. Consider these three questions inspired by the lessons from Peter's journey. The first question, how is your viewing window looking right now? How is your viewing window? Perhaps you find that it is so zoomed in that you feel as if you're looking at the nucleus of a cell and missing out, you know, this entire view from a mountaintop that you can have. This could be the year to take a gentle step of trust with God and look at the incredible vastness beyond you that he has power over. Maybe he is inviting you, enticing you even to see a reality that is way beyond what you can imagine. Question two, do you have a fear of trusting God again because things have not turned out the way you hoped or expected in the past despite prayer? Perhaps you are in the storm right now and are struggling to understand why God even allowed it and hasn't calmed it yet. But remember Peter being called out to step out with no change in his circumstance, only to end up falling under. Yet, the experience he gained with Jesus is one that only he in history can now claim. Maybe this year is a year for us to gradually shift our focus 
from the outcomes we expect of God to the supernatural way he is meeting us on the stormy sea. And question three, is fear of failure holding you back from trusting and stepping out with God? Maybe you have been afraid of taking a step of faith for fear of failing God, others, or even yourself. Maybe the first step is knowing that failure is an expected part of the journey and that God has contingencies already planned for your falls that were set before the foundation of the earth. Remember Peter and take the opportunity to embrace your baby steps with God this year, knowing that if and when you fall, as a child might when it starts to learn walking, you have a saviour waiting to pick you up and keep going. So again, friends, Happy New Year. Despite the challenges and ongoing uncertainties around us, I pray that this year may be a year of many breakthroughs in the spiritual realm. I pray that it may be a year of deeper and more focused trust in him. And I pray that it's a year where we can all find ourselves out on the stormy sea, walking with our Lord and best friend.